So Harappan civilization, many of you might have heard about the Harappan civilization, right? Maybe Indus civilization, Indus Valley civilization, Sindhu Saraswati civilization, Saraswati civilization, there are many different names, right? But all of them point to one civilization which existed in the third millennium BCE around 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. So we are going to talk about the journey what we have learned from Harappan civilization or Indus civilization, it's open to all of you. You can call by any name, right? So, we will be discussing the journey throughout nearly 100 years. We are going to complete next year, next in the next year, we are going to complete 100 years of its discovery. Many of you might not be aware of that, right? Nearly 100 years back on uh, September 20th, 1924, it was announced to the world. Before that, we didn't know. We didn't know anything about a civilization that was existing in the Indian subcontinent before that. And we only knew about Buddhism. And that was dating back to 6th century BC. Maybe we knew about Emperor Ashoka, maybe Chandragupta Maurya, or the Guptas, Mughals. But we didn't know anything about this Harappan civilization. Right? So, we will be slowly peeping into that what were the different phases of discovery and what is the present state of knowledge, what we know about Harappan civilization. Different scholars, different universities, different government agencies in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, they have all contributed. Not only that, these countries. Now we know that the Harappan civilization, the remains, the people of, the, of that culture, they were even in Oman. You might not believe that, right? Modern day Oman. Bahrain, Iran, Tajikistan, Syria, Iraq, even some of the artifacts they have been found in Egypt, Turkey, Greece. So, this is the fascinating story of Harappan civilization. How these people ventured so far, they might not have gone directly, but their products. So, it was a global economy in 3rd millennium BC, nearly 4500 years back. And we people, particularly the people from Gujarat, they participated in an international trade that was spanning nearly 2500 kilometers on the west, maybe another 1500 kilometers in the north up to Central Asia, Afghanistan. We were all trading, we were all roaming here, right? So, just to begin with, I salute my Guru. Always we should remember our Guru. My Guru is Dr. R. S. Bisht, who taught me Harappan archaeology. And I am also grateful to so many institutions, including my own institution, IIT Gandhinagar, my parent institution, Archaeological Survey of India. And I also thank the Indus University for invite me, inviting me to talk here. And also, this what I am going to present is the contribution of so many scholars, hundreds of scholars who have worked in the field, who have researched in the lab, and who have interpreted. So, this is the brief story when it was announced in. 1924. So, this is the uh, newspaper in which it was published in 1924. You can see here, it was published like this, announcing the discovery. That too, after three years of excavation at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. At Harappa, it was started in 1921 and in Mohenjo-daro, it was started in 1922. So, after two or three years, they finally concluded this this, uh, the material remains or whatever coming from here, they belong to a single civilization. Then it was announced and immediately after one week, you can note the date here, 20, September 20, 1924, 27, 1924. Within one week, scholars working in Syria, Iran, they noted that the Indus artifacts, they are found there, right? So, there is a deep connection with your university also here. Hmm. The artifacts of the Harappans, they were found in Syria. This particular person, he noted that from an excavation at Susa. Susa again belongs to another civilization known as the Elamite civilization. It is found in Iran. So, from there, they found in a third millennium BCE context. That is 4,500 years back because their culture, it was dated at the particular point of time. Our culture wasn't dated. 
because we don't have this kind of dynastic list and the script was not deciphered. So, we rely upon this relative dating. So, they immediately dated that look your artifacts they date back to 2500 BCE. So, immediately our chronology it was pushed back by 2000 years. So, this is the greatest contribution within announcement of one week. Within the announcement of one week, so they have found the contacts also with the Mesopotamian region. So, this is the greatest contribution and if you look into the timeline, it starts from 1826. From 1826 onwards, people were visiting Harappa, particularly Harappa, it is now in Pakistan. They, they are visiting Harappa from 19, 1826. From the time period, many different people visited Charles Mason, Alexander Berners, then ultimately Alexander Cunningham, he visited on three occasions and finally, he also brought to light certain antiquities, but they could not understand because at that point of time, they did not believe any story before Buddhism. Whatever the history of India, it st stops at the story of Buddhism. Before that, there was nothing like that, right? They thought there is no history of Indian civilization. But when slowly they started to investigate, more and more sites came into being and the sites were being excavated from 1921 onwards, they discovered this civilization. So, that is the announcement here. The announcement happens nearly 100 years. 1826 is the first year the reporting of Harappa. The announcement comes in 1924. You can understand, right? 98 years after the first visit by an, by an external visitor. I mean, we Indians might have been knowing that this, these sites belong to some ancient culture, but it was not uh, uh, known. So, it took nearly 100 years and exactly we are again 99 years after the discovery. Next year, we are going to celebrate the anniversary of the discovery of this civilization, glorious civilization, right? So, this civilization will be again revived, again understood in a better manner. So, from that time period onwards, 1924 onwards, there, there was a series of events which took place, which culminated in the discovery of several other cities and several other sites in Sindh, Baluchistan, in Pakistan, modern day Punjab, western Punjab and eastern Punjab, Gujarat and now we have a fairly very good idea about the civilization and multidisciplinary studies have been come into being now. Lot of sciences are being applied, right? It is not only history, it is not only archaeology, it is material sciences, it is uh, advanced physics, techniques, chemistry, right? computer sciences, statistics, mathematics, you name any scientific discipline that can be applied to archaeology and that can be applied to the understanding of Indus civilization or the Harappan civilization in a better manner. So, this was the picture in 1947 when India got independence, we had only one site on the Indian side that was Rangpur, only one site, all the known sites including Harappan and Mohenjo-daro went to Pakistan. So, it was a great loss in terms of our own history, our own ancient past. So, it took a lot of time for us, our, our scholars to investigate more and more and now they have found a lot of uh, other sites. Now, we have a better chronology. We now know that our culture, our own roots of our culture, it goes back to 8th millennium BP, BC, that is around 10,000 years back. We know from a site in Mahargad in Pakistan, how they started to settle down, they started to cultivate, they started to domesticate animals. So, they had a had an agro-pastoral economy. They were cultivating, they were domesticating animals, they were depending upon that kind of economy. Slowly, they had food all through the year. Previously, what was happening? They were roaming from place to place. They were collecting food, they were hunting, they were gathering, but now they are producing food, right? So, through the production of food, they had a year long surplus. They can consume food at any point of time. There is no necessity just uh, hang, hang, hang around a uh, bow and arrow. Uh, they go and uh, hunt and bring animals. No. Now they just go to the granary, take the grains, they can uh, make a flour and they can have their bread. Okay. Similarly, they had vegetables, all those kind of stuff. So, this is the kind of story which resulted in an explosion in population. So, when the population grows, there is complexity. I mean, many of you might be knowing uh, what is the complexity when there is a large group of people, right? 
you might be observing in your class i mean if you are a large group of class you will have different groups you will have different uh, kind of arguments for against everything so if imagine if there are thousands of people concentrated in a very small space there will be of course controversy there will be of course political uh, kind of sort of setup there will be hierarchy there will be different groups there will be domination of certain communities so all these things happen so this is the complex nature wherever you go in the world egyptian mesopotamian all these things are observed right when there is a growth in population explosion in population the hierarchical element comes into being that's how the chief ten koi raja maharaja those concepts comes into existent administrator then uh, uh, then uh, assisting people ministers army standing army all those stuff uh, kind of things it comes because of uh, convergence of people at a single larger sp space so that that happen in the indian subcontinent also and that is also common along all other civilizations if you look into egyptian mesopotamian everywhere initial stage was cultivation cultivation of plants wheat barley then domestication of animals so if this, this this combination led to the prosperity the prosperity when when the prosperity was there they were indulging in many many kind of craft activities they were producing ceramics there was no metal artifacts metal uh, utensils at that particular point of time they were only making ceramics from the pottery the cooking they were storing they were uh, trading they were transporting all those stuff all these were containers cooking vessels all those stuff they were all produced on a mass scale so it's a large demand for the potters then the metal smiths came they were producing copper they were smelting copper then various kind of ornaments they were producing our ornaments they were made of many different materials it's not coming from a single location it was coming from all over the indus plains because indus plains no stone is available so they have to go to baluchistan they have to go to gujarat they have to go to northern pakistan maybe rajasthan so all the mineral resources they are spread all around the indus plains so they were getting the raw materials specialized the craftsmen were there to produce the various kind of ornaments so again the complexities grow so someone has to manage them manage the resources bring them to the cities redistribute them so all these things required administration so this is the level of regional cultures many regional cultures spread across the greater indus valley since there was some regional culture gujarat there was one regional culture punjab there was another regional culture they were all located to the raw material resources for example in gujarat excellent raw material resources for making stone jewelry even today if you go to khambar you you might see the jewelry made of many precious stones semi precious stones they are uh, red in color multi colored stones they still make the jewelry it all originated from the harappan civilization right so similarly if you go to the punjab region copper came from rajasthan so they were closely associated with the copper production so we see all this kind of uh, location of different cultures to the some of the raw material resources but at some point of time a group of maybe traders or merchants or even some administrators they thought you see the resources are spread in a very huge area i mean how to pull them together right so they thought we should integrate we should come together so that we can pull in all the resources spread around the entire indus plains so that is how the harappan civilization emerged whatever red point you are seeing it is the urban stage cities cities emerged there was an administrator there was a system of writing there was a standardization of uh, weighing system there was a uh, system of uh, international trade so all these th things came around during this 2600 bc in the in in the sorry i mean harappan is some, somewhere gone here so the full screen is not coming anyways so all the red points they all point towards the urban phase in the in the mesopotamian and uh, egyptian period we are seeing the emergence of pyramid pyramid in egypt ziggurats in the in the mesopotamian uh, civilization so they are all urban features they had a vast system of uh, writing they had standing armies in 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 the egyptian and mesopotamian we didn't have any standing armies i mean we were peace loving people we did not fight any uh, war we did not uh, maybe massacre our uh, neighboring states we could have just integrated just for the sake of 
benefits emanating from many different regions. So, that, that could be the scenario. So, this is the complete story of uh, Harappan civilization starting from around uh, 8000 uh, BC onwards, we have a continuous evolution of cultures, right. So, this is the understanding in, in, in the broader sense, this is the understanding and all the story dates back to 8th millennium BCE. They were living in villages, they were having stone tools, they did not have any metal tools. They were harvesting their crops using this kind of stone tools set in bitumen. Simple stones, they were chipped as sharp edges, they were hafted in bitumen and they were used as a sickles, right. So, this was the earliest technology. Later on the metals came, I mean it came nearly 2000 years later. So, we have evidence of wheat and barley, the impressions are seen, seen on the clay. They were living in this kind of uh, mud brick houses, very, uh, very uh, simple and uh, primitive, but it, they were trading. You look into the long uh, distant contacts of 8000 BCE. So, people they are located here in the Balochistan area, they were trading with the Gulf of Kutch, Makran coast, Oman coast and also Central Asia. Long distances, 2000 kilometers, 2500 kilometers. Can you imagine without the aid of any navigation techniques, no transportation, nothing, how could they manage this kind of long distance trade? Again, now slowly the evidence comes up through the presence of some communities, they are living along the coast, they are very closer to the raw material resources, they procure the raw materials and they supply to the inward uh, uh, located uh, cities. So, this is, this is the kind of arrangement which existed thousands of years back. And this kind of jewelry, they are found in the burials. They buried the jewelry, they buried the sheep, goat, whatever uh, precious uh, things, what they were, whatever they had. Jewelry, it indicates the hierarchy, maybe some wealthy individual, sheep and goats as a food. Because there was a belief in life after life, even after dead, they are dead, they have to have some food, right? So, in the afterlife, they have to have food. So, that is why they also buried the food items and in some places they also buried certain ritualistic objects. You see this object hold, uh, held by this lady, this is a female burial, a triangular object, this is a triangular object, she is holding like this, which later on develops into a beautiful series of female figurines. This is one of the most amazing stuff which they have discovered. Thanks to the French archaeologist working in Pakistan, Francois Jarij and uh, Catherine Jarij. See, they found this triangular objects of 8000 BCE slowly transforming into a series of stages and ultimately they emerged into full blown developed form of female figurines. The, the cult, the identification of these uh, figurines with some female. Uh, representation that goes back to 8th millennium BCE and ultimately why it is there in a burial that too held by this lady, right. These are certain intangible aspects, we may never give the exact meaning to that because they are widely separated by time and space, we do not have any written evidences, but ultimately it has some meaning, right. Maybe, maybe they wanted to again reborn, eh? they wanted that this is the, this is the child that is going to be reborn. I am again going to be reborn as a another child. So, this, this could be the meaning we, we can say. But interestingly, they were also applying red color ochre on their body. Again, this has certain significance. We may not give exact meaning to that, but some observations on the modern day tribes and the communities, they indicate that they apply some colored pigments on their body, maybe to ward off the insects and other uh, uh, pests actually. Okay, this could be some practice which was being followed thousands of years back. I mean, that still it, would, it was continuing. So, these are some in, interesting snippets from the uh, thing, but ultimately what they were doing is that they were producing vast quantity of ceramics. Different regions had different kind of ceramics. That is how we identify the cultures. Each one had their own time and space. Southern Sindh is different from Gujarat. Gujarat is different from uh, Punjab. Punjab is different from Balochistan. So, each and every region they had their kind of unique ceramics. So, that is how we name the, them as a different cultures, but they were contemporary, they had the different styles, different uh, customs and ultimately they are all integrated into the Harappan culture. So, this slide I showed earlier, this is the uh, scenario before independence, 
this is the scenario at present you see what transformation if you look at the map of 1947 this was the meager evidence of uh, harappan civilization now we have over 1500 sites many different kind of cities towns villages and also hamlets representing the entire landscape of the harappan civilization and it is deeply connected with the rivers right many of you might have heard about uh, saraswati river right saraswati and uh, one of the nomenclature is also indus saraswati or the sindhu saraswati civilization but where was the saraswati again that's a long debate uh, going on among several uh, scholars and uh, many people have identified it in, in india some even uh, trace it back to afghanistan somewhere in different parts of uh, south asia but there are clinching evidences now we have the remote sensing data which clearly places a river continuously flowing from the shivaliks to the run of Kaj. so th that is indicated by this kind of remote sensing thing so this is the scientific data and what the literature is telling literature is giving very clear evidences right it is being known from the 19th century i mean we know from the 10th mandala of the rigveda particularly two verses it mentions about the series of rivers starting from yamuna and uh, ganga in the east to to the west we have the rivers of uh, gomal and the swat and all the rivers so it's a complete geography they are long span of geography they are telling if this is the kind of idea about geography when they place saraswati between yamuna and satluj how can they take it to afghanistan can any sensible person take it uh, to afghanistan i mean it is really beyond imagination that people have some this kind of misconceived notions that if we we can alter the geography described in one of the ancient literature right so this literature clearly places saraswati between yamuna and satluj and that is where the geography of uh, river saraswati and it was flowing before 1900 bce and again scholars have tried to correlate uh, uh, this uh, rigvedic geography with the harappan civilization there may be some uh, differences but ultimately a river which was flowing before 1900 bc a culture which was flour flourishing before 1900 bc there is a lot of uh, uh, thinking we need to uh, do so now we have a better chronology we have a better hierarchy we know there were larger cities like harappa mohenjadado uh, rakhi gadi dolavira of course here in gujarat we have uh, dolavira then we have uh, two more cities uh, ganveriwala and uh, lakhanjadado in pakistan so these form the highest tier right like uh, delhi bombay calcutta then we have the uh, next level of uh, hierarchy we have the um, larger towns then we have smaller towns villages then hamlets we have a complete hierarchy as though if we look in a modern sense we have we have in the modern sense also we have this hierarchy the larger towns are larger cities they are supported by the smaller villages and all the agricultural and the uh, pastoral uh, communities which are living in the vicinity so this same sort of structure was existed existing during the harappan civilization we have a better chronology now because of the radiocarbon dating we know now understand starting from 8000 bc onwards we are a continuously evolving culture and urbanism it reached around 2600 bc urban stage is 2600 but we were existing even much much before that so we have also two cities of the harappan civilization in the world heritage list how many of you know that uh, dolavira is a world heritage list can you raise your hands how many of you know dolavira is a world heritage site right so it was inscribed very recently in 1921 is 2021 just uh, uh, two years back it was inscribed and the first city uh, to be put in the world heritage list was mohenjadaro way back in 1980 1980 and after 41 years we got another site right so we need to have more and more investigation more and more understanding more and more uh, multidisciplinary approaches people like you younger minds with different kind of approaches we you, you are required to understand the civilization in a better manner and so that we can discover much much more so this is mohanjadaro some some glimpses and this is dolavira dolavira is one of the best preserved cities of the harappan civilization you know why any guesses why it is best preserved the clue is here in the picture anybody know what is the what is the reason for its best preservation 
because stone is used in the architecture right stone architecture lot of stone material was available locally limestone sandstone it was available locally so it was used extensively in the architecture so it is best preserved right so it was as i told you it was uh, inscribed very recently so if we look into the past cultures at least scholars name at least four preconditions one when one can reach the state level society or a kind of a urban stage the first one is the subsistence you need to have food right if you don't have food can you make any jewelry can you make pottery can you make copper implements if you don't have food right the first precondition is you need to have enough food throughout the year otherwise you have you have to find your own food you have to produce your own food right so if the if the if the people vast majority of the people if they are producing food if they are keeping it in the granary if they are giving it to you to make certain artifact then you will make so that was the first precondition producing food then they had a very good support through the pastoral economy because of the sheep and goat cattle all those related economy that came into being so they had food year year around so that is the first precondition second is the trade networks when there is a hierarchy when there is a group of people who are becoming more and more wealthy because of the land holdings they like to kind of show off right so they have to make different kind of jewelry so they have to make also copper implements so they have to control the resources so when the resources are far away they have to come to the city then actually emerges the group to control that also so that is the second precondition social and economic networks without that the civilization may collapse they can't trade with the distant communities the third one is the complex technologies copper metallurgy was a complex technology right it was not known to everybody so it it originated somewhere in the harappan civilization and it was controlled by a set of people only right so the, that's an example copper uh, technology and even the jewelry this kind of jewelry if you look into this kind of jewelry it took nearly 3 months to produce this kind of jewelry so again it's a complex technology and finally the social hierarchy social hierarchy it was necessary to control not only control the raw material resources access also but to also maintain law and order also to maintain the economic order to trade with the different uh, communities so all these four uh, preconditions put together they were the reason behind for the emergence of state level societies so we'll just uh, pass through and see glimpses how this different uh, uh, preconditions they are satisfied in the harappan uh, uh, civilization also so first is the subsistence economy we have lot of evidences uh, coming from all around uh, the harappan civilization the the presence of wheat and barley are the staple uh, uh, food then rice also came then lot of pulses vegetables fruits all these things have been found from the archaeological record there is a separate branch of archaeobotanists who work and who identify them we also have evidence of a large quantity of uh, animal bones sheep goat cattle domesticated ones then wild animals they were also hunting it's not only they are relying upon the domesticated ones they were also hunting animals so we also find evidence for wild animals they were procuring raw materials from all around i was telling uh, this briefly agate carnelian it was available only here this kind of stones another stone steated it came from northern pakistan and uh, rajasthan and uh, northeastern gujarat copper so they were getting all around the raw materials so this is another major thing they were maintaining the raw material uh, acquisition networks so th this has been uh, uh, read and understood very widely now so one important evidence i will i will tell you about this kind of grinding stone so nowadays we go to big basket right big basket amazon and order atta right you just click one button do some uh, transactions you get your flour delivered in at your uh, door step right imagine 4500 years back kya karna padega you have to do your own hard work har ek din piso right otherwise you can't have your bread 
So these grinding stones formed a very important component. Scholars like Randall Law, who has worked very extensively on this uh, grinding stone, they are procuring materials for grinding, making the grinding stone from nearly 400 kilometers away. 500 kilometers away, kyun kya necessity hai? Because they have to be hard. Hard nahi hoga, to kya hoga? Kya jayega aata ke saath? Rath. Hey na, if the stones are soft, you will eat the sand particles also. So, it has to be very hard, withstand the pressure, withstand the uh, kind of hardness. So, they were procuring this kind of harder materials which has a lot of quartz content, quartzite. Quartzite makes a very good grinding stone. So, they were procuring. Harappa ka jo log jo hai, Pakistan, they were procuring grinding stone from Haryana. Nearly 450 kilometers away, right? So, this is the kind of effort they are making because this was possible because of the integration. They are now a civilization, not a rural culture. Rural culture hoga to only they can, they are satisfied only with their regional materials, whatever available locally. So, when they have access, so they were procuring more and more raw materials. So, this is the procurement network starting from Somewhere here in Haryana, it's it's going to Harappa. So different uh, type of uh, grinding stones they were using. An another thing is this red colored one. Wherever you see the red colored stone in the third millennium BCE context, 4,500 years back, you can blindly say it came from Gujarat. And Gujarat supplied the most high quality agate carnelian which was used in the jewelry and which was the landmark jewelry of Harappan civilization and it was exported to Mesopotamia in large quantities and the Mesopotamians they write about that. Bhai hum logon ko carnelian aata tha. This red color stone was known as carnelian. They tell two types of carnelian came. One is the best quality and one is the imitated variety. You look, Harappans they were also making certain modifications, imitation is they are modifying because it is not available plentifully in the nature. So, they were procuring certain type of raw materials from the many different localities, usko heat kiya, then they attain this red color. Naturally, it is yellowish in color, but if you heat it, slowly it becomes red color. So, the Mesopotamians, they were aware of all these things. So, they were making these kind of adjustments, this kind of jewelry and ultimately exporting. And one more item is this kind of pillar elements. Only place where we have got is from Dolavira in Gujarat, from where they manufactured these pillars and also exported to Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. So, this is the kind of advanced nature and various procurement networks we, we now understand. You, you can say the, the arrows pointing from the raw material source to the uh, localities where we, we now know Ambaji. Ambaji also you might have heard about, right? It's a very famous uh, pilgrimage center. From Ambaji, it's not that it has suddenly become a pilgrimage center. It was the center of copper production some 4,500 years back, right? There are abandoned uh, copper mines from where we also collected, we also reproduced and we found that copper can be uh, extracted from here. Similarly, this uh, pillar elements I told you about from near Dolavira, they were manufactured and ultimately exported to Harappa and Mohenjo-daro and they were doing vast water management systems. Water management is very much relevant in the present day society and in the future also. We don't know what will happen in the future when we have depleted all our resources and we, we have forgotten all our technologies. So, this is what we have to learn from the Harappans, how they managed preserving water, how they were harnessing the water. On an island in, Dola, uh, in uh, Gujarat, on the Khadir island, the Dolavirans, they were building vast reservoirs series of reservoirs, they were building dams across the smaller streams, diverting the water, storing them all around the year. So, we have excellent evidences for this kind of water management systems from uh, Dolavira and we have lot of evidences about uh, how they were manufacturing certain kind of jewelry. So, we have also conducted series of researches and, and the tradition still continues in Khambad. This person in Khambad, Pratap Bhai, he still uses the same kind of technology yet with a different kind of materials, but the technology is still continuing. So, we have excellent evidences of uh, manufacture of this kind of beautiful stone jewelry, right? 
they were they, this is a complex technology red color base with a white color pigment they are applying they are applying an alkali and they are heating it slow heating it and to produce this white color this was not produced anywhere in the world at a particular point of time only the harappans knew this technology right and this is one of the complex technologies and these kind of uh, longer beads which were used to make this kind of waist bands this is the ladies jewelry right they were they were wearing these kind of waist bands with multiple rows and segmented beads and ultimately they were also exported to mesopotamia and mesopotamians they were highly valuing this one and they were retrading once they procured that they might have sold that at a higher cost so this is what happening in the third millennium bc so we have a series of uh, scientific investigations which clearly demonstrate the harappans uh, having this technology and the khambat area where at present also we can see the continuation of this kind of uh, uh, trade and not only that we have solid evidences when a particular kind of stone came from raw material source to a distant place and there it was buried in a burial like for example this colored stone it came from dolavira from here it was traded to harappa at harappa they manufactured a bead out of the stone and ultimately the that bead finds its place in the burial so this is the complete history of transportation of a raw material precious one going to a crafts person's house from there he manufactures and then it also goes to his burial so we have different complex technologies also demonstrated in a very beautiful manner they had a bangle type known as stone ware bangle they were baking the clay to high temperatures 1100 1200 degrees partly melting it it becomes a stone resembles a stone so that's why it's known as a stone ware bangle and they were manufactured un under a controlled production even after so much of advancement we don't know how they manufactured we only know this process but we have not reproduced that scholars have tried again and again but they have not reproduced them and copper copper was also used as a jewelry and at times it was used as an important jewelry for the elites you can see this famous uh, so called priest king he has some piece of jewelry on the forehead which is uh, which can be demonstrated as a gold jewelry and also as a copper jewelry so this is this is how we see certain jewelry they are only for the elites and we also through this uh, thing we can reconstruct that there could be a loosely arranged city state system they were not an empire harappans they were not an empire there, there was no standing army there was no warfare no capture of cities no massacres no burning down cities it they were integrated so this is something unique i mean whatever whatever we see it's a contrast difference from the mesopotamians or the egyptian ones and the scholars they agree that there, there could be loosely arranged city states dolavira might be capital of the gujarat region mohenjodaro may be the controlling the sindh harappa western punjab rocky gadi eastern punjab so there could be loosely arranged city states which were controlling a small hinterland it they were integrated right that could be the arrangement uh, in the case of harappan so we have well planned cities we know the ratios and proportions followed at uh, uh, dolavira and uh, and a reconstruction of the the city it clearly indicates the kind of defense mechanisms which they uh, arranged while entering into the city at dolavira at least we have this part of the settlement one needs at least uh, five levels of security to enter into this uh, part of the settlement so this is highly hierarchical why a person or a group of families they should isolate themselves in one walled portion of the city it means they are the uh, power holders they are the uh, administrators they are the economic uh, heads they are the maybe the spiritual heads they are the ultimate rulers maybe so th that's how we see from the architecture different uh, types of evidences we see vast architectural remains which clearly indicate uh, the extraordinary feat in which they arrange this uh, city we also see the burials some of the burials they are so elaborate uh, it can be only restricted to the elites it cannot be for the common persons for example from the dolavira we see this kind of uh, huge mud cumulus and inside that we see the burials and it is unique to the entire harappan civilization we don't have evidence in other parts of the harappan civilization only here we have and it has surprisingly similarities with the burials royal burials of bahrain bahrain 
it's in the Middle East, it's in the West Asian region where the Harappans were trading at one point of time and there you can see the royal burials in a similar architecture. But we don't have any direct evidence, but these kind of indirect evidence in clearly indicate there could be some sort of borrowings uh, happening. The Harappans, they were also burying the dead. The, these are simple burials from Dolavira, but we don't have uh, skeletons. We don't have large number of skeletal remains, but we have all kind of symbolic burials. You can see simple burial pits, sometimes uh, encased with stone elements. So, they were burying uh, like this also. And from the burials from different other places, we can also understand different uh, elements of the composition. Nowadays, DNA is being used. There are different kind of sophisticated uh, techniques being used that can be used to understand who are they, whether they are local, non-local, all these elements can be understand, understood. And also, from the jewelry, we can clearly understand the kind of context in which they were buried from where they were using, whether it is a necklace or a bracelet or a, or a, a ear ornament, all these things can be understood, right. So, we have uh, uh, another very important uh, question about the script. It is not deciphered, right. I told you, I mean, we do not know the history of the Harappans. We know only from the archaeological remains. We do not know what they were writing because it is not deciphered. But there are certain studies which, which clearly indicate its internal character, how many signs, what is the initial sign, what is the middle sign, what is the terminal sign, all those things we understand, but we do not know what is the language. So, this is another area where scholars are working and ultimately the external trade where the Harappans were trading with, right. So, they were trading with the Mesopotamia. We have evidence from the Mesopotamia. They clearly mention about three regions, Dilman, Magan and Meluha. Right? The Mesopotamians from 2500 BC onwards, they say, we traded with these three different regions, Dilman, Magan and Meluha. So, Dilman is identified with Bahrain, Magan is identified with Oman and Meluha is identified with the Harappan civilization and what they were getting? They were getting this kind of jewelry and this, this jewelry, it is found in the, it is found in the Mesopotamian region, not here. All this kind of jewelry, I, ha I have shown you earlier also, this jewelry, they are found in the Harappan civilization. Now, this jewelry, they are coming from the Mesopotamian region. So, it is a clear indication that the Harappans, they were trading. We have lot, lot more other evidences also. I told you about the evidences from Turkey, Greece, Egypt and all. So, this is a plotting of all the Harappan artifacts coming from different parts of the world. You can see the extent of uh, Harappan trade. They were reaching far and wide. Their, their items of uh, trade, they, they are reaching far and uh, wide. And finally, when we uh, talk about how the Harappans came to an end, there were very many uh, fanciful stories earlier, like deforestation, earthquake, flooding, lot of things were proposed earlier. But recently, during the past 10, 20 years, series of paleoclimatic uh, studies, now we can understand the past climatic changes. So, there are a series of studies which have been done in the South Asian context. It clearly says that around 2200 BCE, eh, that is 4200 years back, there was a climate shift. What is happening today? I mean, you may be, you, you may be seeing in the news, right? They, every day there is some sort of a climatic change. Ice is melting. There is a rise in sea levels. These are all due to the human interventions, right? But at that particular point of time, it might have been due to the climatic uh, pattern which used to alter every few thousand years. So, there was a vast climatic change, change in the monsoonal regime. The rains were reducing. So, it was a long period of drought for around 200 years, starting from 2200 BC, 2200 BC. It lasted for nearly 200 years. And then ultimately, they could not cope up. And that is how around 1900 BCE, uh, we see uh, the, the Harappans, they, they declined or they, they again transformed into a rural communities, rural settlements. We see the, the integrated area now reduced to only regional pockets, right. So, again, there were uh, uh, geological events also, the river Saraswati dried up. Around the same period, 1900 BC, there are very uh, lot of coincidence here, and a complete vast network of river system it dried up. 
so that also led to the shifting of settlements from this part to this this part to the ganga yamuna dwarf that also happened around 1900 bce so this is how we see the long uh, uh, what is a evolution of culture starting from around uh, 8000 bce and ultimately they reached the pinnacle around uh, 2500 bce 2600 bce declined around 1900 bce then again they resurged around uh, 600 bce then we see the historical period when the mahajanapada and the mauryan empire and ultimately we see the emergence of large empires around 3rd century bc so this is the long one long story of uh, how we reached an urban stage declined and again we we were dormant for nearly 1000 years and again we researched again and we are progressing a lot now with our last knowledge of the past it's not that we have gained everything now right we have in, invented everything many things were invented thousands of years back we have modified with it, uh, with the transmission of knowledge from generation to generation we have improvised ourselves we have learned from our past mistakes and my message to all of you is that you have to learn from our past mistake and you cannot re, uh, live in isolation whatever happened in the past it has a relevance in the present so that you can plan your future in a better manner if you forget your past if you forget your past glory past history you cannot be a, a future planner or a future uh, achiever maybe right even in your own uh, discipline you have to learn through your past uh, technologies past developments past history and that's how you reach here then you plan for the future right all your experience gained from this uh, vast pool of knowledge thank you